Hello and welcome to The Skating Lesson. My name is Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Byer, and I feel very underqualified. <laughs> <laughs> well, today we are thrilled to welcome Shepard Clark, Debbie Thomas, and Karen Cortland Kelly from the World Figure and Fancy Skating Championships. And we wanted to discuss the event, Shepard and Debbie's performances, and what the heck fancy skating is, as we get a lot of comments. So I thought I would let Jonathan take the lead and, you know, get to the bottom of what all of this is. Yes. Yeah, I have been following with great anticipation. Obviously, I remember all of you from your competitive days. I am the only person here without a national medal. So it feels, very, I feel very nude at the moment. <laughs> um, so I was just curious, like, can you just give me like what you would consider your elevator spiel about sort of what this is and why, why you do it? Do you want to start, Shepard, and then we'll go Debbie and Karen? Yeah. Terrific. I, I, I It'd be a pleasure. Um, about 10 years ago, I got an invitation from the World Figure Sports Society to participate in a unique historic event that Patrick and Karen Kelly, along with Dick Button and Doug Wilson and a lot of the skating icons had come together to create to preserve the namesake of figure skating, which are the figures. It was a unique event, a unique assemblage of people, of icons that could not be duplicated today, even though we have great people who come. Um, some of these people are so old now or have passed away, but it's um, an event, it's a world championships on black ice for um, the greatest skater of figures, the namesake of figure skating that goes back hundreds of years. And it's named for uh, a book written by George A. Meager, who is a Canadian champion in the 1800s he wrote a book that was published in 1895 entitled Figures and Fancy Skating. That's right. <laughs> it's like Karen's okay. Torah, really. Okay. I mean, yeah. We have a video of her going through it. <laughs> yes. So, Debbie, this was your first year participating in the event. So how would you describe fancy skating and what was your experience like? Well, I, it's funny because the, the competition has evolved. Um, over the years and, and Shepard and, you know, I, I've been close to Shepard the whole time during that process. He's, he's been asking me to do this. I kept saying no, because I thought it was too hard and, um, and it has evolved so that it's, it's more user-friendly. And I, and I think, you know, because figures are actually extremely difficult and, um, I, I knew that it was going to be challenging um, but I really didn't take a close look until this year. And I really started watching some of my contemporaries who had done the championships. And I was like, wow, that's, that's really difficult. And Shepard had this vision to really, um, you know, bring this championship to the, to the level that it deserves to be. Um, it blends the world professional legacy with the figures and what what is um unique about it is that professional skating is is something that that skaters generally develop after they skate there's there's a beautiful uh number that Dorothy Hamill does to PA Jesu where where uh Dick Button is is saying she's a better skater now than she was when she was a competitor and what happens is you you do go through this transformation after you um, get out of you know competition and things like that. You have a chance to really focus on the art side of figure skating. And so what this championship does is it really celebrates the world's greatest skating artists, and it has you know exemplifies the the four major art genres fine art with the figures, decorative art with the costumes, performing art with the performance and recording art with the music. And so when Shepard started explaining it that way, it just, it it became very addictive. And I said, okay, I'm gonna do this and be a part of this. And um, it, it was, like I said before, the hardest thing I've ever done um, but getting through it and actually um, 
being able to perform and and have people say, wow, you know, we, we didn't know you could skate like that. Um, it, it really is surreal. So it, it's been fantastic being a part of bringing this championship to the public eye. Um, I'm glad to have been able to be, um, you know, just part of making that that possible. Now there's a lot of momentum, a lot of excitement, a lot of interest. And, um, you know, we really want to make this a championships that many more people can be a part of. And, and just even having that experience in Lake Placid, being on the black ice, having the history of the Olympics and the the art culture that's that's being brought to Lake Placid, it's really it's really something people are not going to want to miss um, next year for the tenth anniversary that coincides with the hundredth year anniversary of the Winter Olympics. It's it's very exciting to be a part of it. But it's interesting, like uh, Dave and my sort of general generation. A lot of our introduction to skating were through those like Dick Button specials, like Magic Memories on Ice, which basically taught us one of two things that figures ruined Janet Lynn's career. That's all I ever re remember learning about figures first. And then that the second portion was eh, it was so boring to watch on TV. We just had to get rid of it. So I went back after Dave was talking to you guys and rewatched your figures from Calgary. And first of all, Best Dressed Award. Every portion of the competition, Debbie Thomas wins Best Dressed Award. And when I saw her in that beautiful sweater and all that stuff, I was like, that's what I would want to wear. Oh my gosh. Olympics. Yeah. Lori Pizina, uh, may she rest in peace. That would mean so much to her. And her daughter, I know, will watch this, Michelle, and she will be crying when she hears it. Oh, things. I mean, for real. Well, like, you want another gold medal dinner right there. <laughs> uh, how, did you, how did you find, because watching all of the clips Dave was posting of the figures portions in Lake Placid, I found it outrageously fascinating and completely interesting did you find it ran in a different way than than you remembered competing them? Well, or... Karen's the organizer, so maybe we should have her explain, yeah. you know, how it's different. Yeah. And yeah, about so with... Janet Lynn and figures, she'll want to she'll want to discuss yeah. this. So yeah. yeah. So yes. Yeah, so to start, um, uh, Janet knows and feels and tells you that skating her beautiful figures you know, made her great, but she actually never had the opportunity to skate like the Maltese Cross and the Swiss S or creative figures or everything that world figure sport does leans on phenomenal uh, history, but we move it all forward in a fun functional way and to make it beautiful for the whole world because it's really an art movement. This is an art movement that cre combines the crown jewels, the jeweled sport, and we move that forward with the fine performing decorative and recording arts as never seen in the history of skating. So what happened with and what Debbie and Shepard just skated has never been seen in the history of skating what happened in Lake Placid. So their creative fancy figures and everyone's creative fancy figures and everything that's been moved in this extraordinary way forward because it's actually um, in the history of skating, these geniuses really understood that it was called the art of skating and it was called the art of skating because you you epitomized art with your blades like a, a painter paints with the paintbrush or the pencil that all, everything you did went from your foot all the way through the top of your head. And this is what creates great line and great skating. And so with World Figure Sport, we actually understand that every focus you wanna have at the World Figure and Fantasy Skating Championship and as a skating artist, and this is for anyone at any age, should be focusing on the fine performing decorative and recording arts. And the goal is to skate on the black ice stage as a world junior or world championship skater for your entire life and creating epic moments in skating. Yeah, and to see it on the black ice was a total game changer for me. Absolutely. Just, and they were just beautiful patterns and things like that. I mean, I didn't know if that was shallow. I just looked at that and I was like, well, how pretty is that? I don't know how they did it. I don't know yeah. if it was difficult or not, but I was like, what a stunning, what a stunning pattern that was. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And the judges are sequestered. So we, okay. World Fear Sport addresses every blockage to the knowledge and any bias in the judging. And mm -hmm. it's really about taking a skater and molding them to be a world skating artist through these four major art genres, which is a world cultural movement. This art movement 
is a world movement in skating being the center stage of this art movement because it is the crown jewels of the jeweled sport. So you were able to um, appreciate something that you were never able, able, ever able to understand or see before mm. that the art comes out of the blades. And then this also created all the flying and created skating like John Curry, um, like Janet Lynn and, and these incredible people who have very long careers and also very, you're looking at two people right here, Shepard Clark and Debbie Thomas, who are, okay, Shepard Clark is the greatest um, skating artist in the history of skating when it comes to skating the number of figures at a world championships, the different types, and also those other kinds, because all those other skaters in the uh, meaning more recent past, and even Debbie herself, never were able to skate a Maltese cross or any of these other interesting patterns um, ever on a world stage. So Shepard Clark for the last nine years has now skated the greatest number and the greatest um, types of figures, which are called fundamental, special, creative, free and flying figures all on the black ice. And I, so. I was floored because I was like, wait, you don't mean the Pears girl. The Pears girl is into all these figures? Or did you just fall in love with them from like early development with that? Well, you know, um, in life, um, I think the whole organization stems from a Karen, point of great, You were great taught by life. Hans Gershweiler. Get at the yeah. picture. No, this is the <laughs> yeah. like, so, thing so, here. Yeah, so, well, the lead. You know. Yes, yes, yes. So um, when I was a very little girl, you know, uh, Mr. Gershweiler would show up in his jacket and tie. And it was a big honor to be taught by Mr. Gershweiler. And he taught me the Swiss S and some other special figures. So um, I was given a great technique at early age. And I realized what I was learning was special from someone who was also very special. And my all my teachers, I um, really respected and realized how special they were also in my life. So the whole organization with our entire board of directors, which includes five Olympians, Dorothy Hemmel, Barbara Wagner, B.B. Zilmer Moritz, um, Patrick Kelly, and myself, and we cover Europe, Canada, and the United States. And um, with everyone's experience on this board of directors, uh, there isn't another organization in the world with that level of experience. So, you know, it comes from a point of gratefulness and perspective. The whole organization, um, uh, entire vision is from gratefulness and perspective. Well, Shepard, what is your take? Because Paul Wiley is a little um, skeptical of these Maltese crosses and, and some of these harder figures, you know, he's into the ones that he competed in. So, you know, talk about competing these other, you know, more creative figures and what that is like. First, a shout out to Paul, who has to be, of all the men skaters who've ever lived, the greatest stylist Oh, you know, he and John Curry stand out in my mind for being the most beautiful positions I've ever seen. He really punctuates everything. And I really looked up to him as a competitor of his. And he and I skated the last two figures at the U.S. Nationals, which was a left forward paragraph loop, the same figure that Debbie so magnificently won at the Olympic Games. She won the last two figures of the three at the Olympic Games. Um, getting back to... Uh, you know, the 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 figures from the past and the, the new figures that have been developed. I don't think that as a skater, we really would have um, the full experience of skating. I mean, I wasn't raised learning the figures from the past, but I remember as a child, I said, you know, I looked in these books at the Philadelphia Skating Club and I saw these strange things shaped like bells and crosses and tulips. And I was amazed because I didn't know that skating had a history that went back hundreds of years, you know? So I started trying them and my figures were terrible as a child, but then I got better at them because I began to draw them on paper. And I moved at 12 years old to work with Don Laws in Denver with when he had Scott Hamilton. Then I moved down to Colorado Springs to work with Carlo and Krista Fossi, both of whom were known to be figure masters. So they began to become extremely strong. And then, of course, they were separated from the free skating halfway through my career. But I remember trying some of those figures and being fascinated by them. And when the opportunity came from the Kellys and the icons who got together, I, it, I said, this is this is impossible, but it's also irresistible. I must do this. And then I began to love it more and more. And just as Debbie can tell you, it becomes addictive. In a good way. So, oh, so to just, can I just add, so it's actually amazing to know 
that even a beginning skater can learn a Maltese cross. Even those with disabilities have actually learned and skated a Maltese cross. So we have the actual methodology and the way to teach it. So people are not blocked to learn the special figures and anyone can learn these patterns as long as you have an open mind and a given E for effort. And we can teach you those patterns. Debbie, well, what's the toughest figure for you this year? Say that again. I was asking Debbie what the toughest figure for her was this year going up to the event. Oh, that spinny thing. <laughs> 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 the vocal de pirouette. Yeah. Spinny, yes. It has the two loops in the back. De pirouette. <laughs> I almost fell on it. I, I, well, I, actually, my layout was really good for me. I mean, I actually kind of traced it and actually kind of had round circles, which usually they don't look like that. But, um, I couldn't do the backspin in my figure blades or my freestyle blades. So I just decided I was going to use figure blades because it was just easier. But yeah, that, that one was, that one was tricky. Um, I was, I was actually probably more terrified for the loop because that's a figure that I actually should be able to do. And we were all pretty much terrified <laughs> of the loop figure, the loop-de-loop. -loop. Um because I was really struggling with back inside loops before I got to Lake Placid. The, the, the black ice is very forgiving, I will say that. Um, the, the ice we train on is really sort of hard, you know, hockey freestyle ice. And so actually being able to get on softer ice where you can actually see and edges are, you know, more solid, um, it, was, it was a lot better. So yeah, I mean, I would love to see more black. I'm, I'm like trying to figure out like, how do we make our own like portable black ice rink that we can bring around with us whenever we want? Cause it's, it's the ice is that good. Well, and so, I'm confused cause this is my layman question. You mentioned a figure blade. Do you find that that certain, what is the difference would you say between what makes a blade more ideal for figures? Well, Basically, the freestyle blade has a topic on the bottom so that you can grip, and the figure blade does, it is missing that topic. But Shepard can do them excellent in either blade, so it's possible to do yeah. them. I so just you were competing between <laughs> separate boots. I had two pair of boots. Okay, uh, you don't have to. I mean, you don't have to have to have yeah. back in the day. Um, but you know, we we kind of want the younger generation to pick this up. So, um, you know, we yeah. don't want people to think that they, they have, they to don't, they don't need things yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, you don't have figure blades, you can actually even do the world championship in hockey skates. Well, Karen, you teach them in socks. So can you explain that method and what kind of a workout it is to do figures in socks? Because this was one of the more surprising things, you know? Yes, yeah, so we have the World Skating and Art School, um, which is a virtual academy uh, and or on site. And Dave was able to come to World Skating and Art School, which I'm here at the office of World Figure Sport. And anyone can learn efficiently the figure patterns on, with us, actually also on the floor with hula hoops and socks. And then you take this knowledge and then you can transfer it much easier on the ice. Plus, Dave also did the art of skating and frosting with us at the World Skating and Art School. So you can learn how to create loops, just like the Hostess Cupcake, okay? The loop, the loop, the loop, okay? And this, these creative ways actually help the mind, body, soul, foot connection in fun, efficient, and effective methods for families and for skaters of all ages. And you learn better this way. In John, more creative I, ways. It was like a pastry bag, like when you were on Worst Cooks of America and I was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> also one of the worst artists of drawing the figures, but yes. <laughs> okay, okay, amazing. Yeah, I'm like- He's uh, good. <laughs> so, Debbie and Shepard, how would you describe fancy skating? Because we get that comment all the time. And how is it different from competitive skating or show skating, you know, the different programs that you've put together? I, I'm glad you've asked the question. I think that the way I describe it to people is I say, you bring you at your best. What do you want to say as an artist? 
What music do you want to use? How do you want to uh, adorn yourself? We have basically complete freedom. And it really is about the dance. It's about telling a story, about creating an emotional connection. I have never enjoyed skating more than I have through world figure sport. And I have to thank Karen and Patrick and the board and all of the people involved in evolving this mission. Because when I go out and I'm able to skate from my heart and use my mind and my body, especially in my 50s now, to do something that I've loved my entire life, it really is uh, something I never expected I would ever have, but I'm blessed to have. And I think that the fancy skating is the culmination of everything uh, packaged into a form that anyone in the world can look at and say, that's intrinsically beautiful. And they want to feel what we're feeling. Mm. Yeah. And and I think that, um, you know, having the emphasis on the edges and, um, you know, almost combining the figures with this freedom of artful expression is really um, a big part of it. Um, but it, but it's also about mastery as well. I mean, like if you fall, it's it's a huge deduction. So I took a big risk doing an axel because I it was beautiful I it in a million years. Yeah. I, I took a hard fall on the warm up, and I was just like, I don't even want to do another one. But I I had to do that for me just to prove that I could still do one and perform one. Um, so I decided I was going to take the risk regardless of what happened. So yes, I'm very pleased to have pulled it off and you know and and been able to um, do a program that really was expressive and emotional um, for for the people who are watching. Well, and I would like to commend you both because it was they were both such powerful and moving programs in addition in, in addition to just being masterfully skated because I feel like a lot of times when Dave and I talk about skating, it's just sort of complaining about all of the music and current skating. <laughs> I was very excited when they said, yeah, bring in some vocal music. There is gorgeous vocal music. This is an exciting thing. Most people don't choose to use emotional or beautiful vocal selections <laughs> and you both had such like excellent choices and it proved that like vocal music can be outrageously powerful and beautiful in a skating program and i i was just so appreciative of that can you for those of you who didn't see it can shepherd and debbie can you talk about how you put your programs together what you skated to and kind of what the idea was and how bossy was shepherd in the packaging of this this is what we did well, I mean, he didn't have to twist my arm too hard, you know, when he presented um, Diana Ross singing Amazing Grace. I mean, what, how do you even, like, complain when somebody says, here, here's here's something epic for you to skate to. Um, I think what, you know, your first worry is, can I live up to skating to this? Um and we had to cut it shorter because it was a lot longer. And, and that's why I kind of stand there for a long time before I start. But I love that you stand there for a long time because that's, that's the freedom. Really of dramatic. Of this yeah. event. I yes. <laughs> it built it. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, you know, I, I'll tell, I'm going to tell you the truth because I'm, you know, I steal a lot of things and Shepard steals a lot of things too. He stole things for me and I'm going to tell this story. So I mentioned Dorothy Hamill's Piaget Zoo number, which you can find on YouTube. It's beautiful. And when I was trying to choreograph Amazing Grace, I was really having a hard time holding the edges long enough. I mean, I was like, this is too slow. I can't do this. And so I, you know, I'd seen P.A. Jezu and I said, oh gosh, you know, she's really moving, you know, and holding these edges. So I said, I wonder. So I took P.A. Jezu and I took the music out and I put Amazing Grace to it. And I was like, oh my gosh, it fits. There's my program. I'm just going to do Dorothy's program. I couldn't do it. It was so hard. I couldn't 
do the program. It looks like it shouldn't be that hard, but try it. I couldn't do it. So I, I took a couple of things, but yeah, I, <laughs> I wasn't able to steal Dorothy Hamill's program. No, Debbie, <laughs> is there is in the family, because I once heard a story that your mom would sit at competitions with a video camera and would know if moves needed to go in your program based on what everyone was doing. Is that true? <laughs> what? You would videotape programs and know what everyone was doing if you needed to add something to your programs. Like no, it, we did, she did not. Act getting bad information. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. She had a video camera, but we did not actively steal things from other people, okay. like watch other video. No, that didn't happen. But this is how skating. That's yeah. how skating. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, Jenny's mom would Jenny's mom would make her watch videos and study her competitors well um, yeah see I it's funny I was I was talking to my friend Joe Brackett today and and he was he was telling me he's like I'm terrified because he's considering coming back and skating in this and um he's like but Shepard scares me you know and I'm like why why like he's like weren't you afraid of Katarina I'm like no like I, all I can do is the best I can do. I have no control over the judges. I have no control over my other competitors. Why would I get all worked up about what my competitors are doing? So yeah, I didn't pay that much attention to what everybody else was doing. I was more, you know, focused in my own little world. And, you know, I mean, it, it's hard because the Olympics, I didn't, in the long program, I did not do that program of my life that I wanted to do. And, um, and I, you know, I had to live with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was kind of what my goal was. You know, I, I haven't really ever had a long program where I skated perfectly. And, um, and that's just, you know that, that I think that's where this this fancy skating where you where you really do have to have mastery and you really have to be as close to perfection as possible um you know because it's a uh you know it's it's an experience that that the audience is going through and you don't want to you don't want to break that up well, Debbie, you told me a great story the night before you were competing. We were at dinner and you we were talking about George de la Pena and when he came to work with you because you were missing your triple triple. And I was wondering if you could tell that story. Yeah. And did you think of that before you did your axel? Because I thought of the you know, story. I, when did, I, I didn't exactly think the exact thing, but I, I took the same philosophy. I, I said, you have to be aggressive because the reason I was missing my axel is because I was doing it all squirrely and chickeny and so I I did have to be aggressive but the story is yes I was it was before the Olympics wasn't hitting triple triple George came to work with me and um and so he he wanted to see the program and I said well do you want me to just do triple double because I'm I'm not hitting the triple triple and I don't want to break up the program and he was like no he's like he's like here's what I want you to do he said, as you're going into it, right before you do it, I want you to smile as if you are a tigress and you're going to eat this thing alive. And then just boom, nailed it. You know, and it's, you know, I'm a very psychological um, skater. And so I know that that performance is like, you know, 99.9% .9 psychological. And so, yeah, I mean, when I like fell hard in the warm up, I, you know, my, my first thought was, I don't want to do any more of these axles. And then I was like, no, <laughs> like you have to go for this and you have to really, um, you know, be aggressive and, you know, thankfully it worked, but, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a psychology that, um, you know, I mean, I was glad that it, it came back um, and that, you know, I mean, you hate for the Olympics to be a learning experience, but I really was passive and that's why I didn't hit the triple triple in the Olympics. And then when I didn't hit the triple triple, then I was like, oh, there went the program of my life. And then I was like, oh, this sucks. I got to be out here for another four and a half minutes. And well, thank goodness though. if I got off and <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn from that experience. Um, and now, 
that I'm older and trying to do this, you know, just being able to come together and, and just pull it out. I, you know, very proud of myself. <laughs> very crazy very for Demi. Karen, and you for talked about this dream of having a singer perform at the championships. And I know a singer, you know, I was thinking of yes. it. We're talking about this. So can you yes. talk about like what your vision is with live music at the world figure in fancy skating championships? Yes. So, um, so we are able to have live opera and also any other live musician. So violin, saxophone, and we have been able to, so in 20, um, 21, we actually had some live opera. So we did test it, but the whole goal is that we actually have, um, we have some music that was scored for World Figure and Fantasy Skating Championships, but we'd like to put out an entire um, World Figure and Fantasy Skating album of scores of music that then Debbie can skate to, Shepard can skate to. And also we have the live music on the ice, live opera and or live um, vocals of any type of genre um, actually during the World Championship. So then we are the epitome of fine performing decorative and recording arts on the Black Eye stage. So that's the very big goal. And we know that Jonathan- He knows a lot of opera singers too. I think he could rope them in. It's a fascinating thing. I mean, like this combination of arts that you're talking about, which we always like steal the word from Wagner, which is that Gesamtkunstwerk, which is like all encompassing art. And it's exactly what you're talking about. But that's what's so fascinating. I'll be sitting at a skating event next to some lovely lady and you know, a cat sweatshirt and she just loves skating or something. And then over here, there's an amazing dancer and an amazing classical musician and an amazing visual artist. Like it is such a fascinating thing that draws all of the art forms to it, which makes it so much more interesting than just a sport. Because spoiler alert, I don't follow other sports. I follow other genres of art. <laughs> But, but so, this is an art movement. Yes. Exactly and we have your jacket right. already. Yeah. We yeah. already have your outfit. Oh, for sure. Great. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Sh Shepard and Karen and Debbie are also turning me into a skating artist. Karen seems to think that I could compete against the figures. I don't know if that's really possible in a year, but you know, we're going to make a go for, you know, what this is. I don't know. Because Shepard you rise to different levels. Like it's, for instance, in adult skating, which which we've been talking a great deal about, it's, you know, you're entering at certain levels. H how does that part of the organization work for you guys? Yes, yeah, so it's so fascinating because this really liberates everybody. So as a, for the World Junior Figure and Fantasy Skating Championships, you will have different, um, you know, qualities of those junior skaters. Okay, but everyone under 21 can skate World Juniors. They can also skate the World Championship at any age, okay? Mm -hmm. But you have to be, you know, capable. But we have had world junior competitors also skate the world championships the same year because they were that inspired. So we don't necessarily limit anyone. And the figures are way more attainable, sustainable, and actually way, um, they're way more doable than everyone realizes. It's just whether or not you psych yourself out or you psych yourself up the way Debbie explains, you know. So this year we had a, a paid homage to um, Axel with the bracket and the wall jump. So we have a flying figure. We have a spinning figure with the back spin, which also pays homage to everyone spinning. And this actually goes back as far as 1882. They were already doing flying and spinning figures then. We have the quad cupcake cake figure, which is like four mini cupcakes you gotta think of, and everyone can skate a quad. It's two changes of edge and four circles. Um, and then you can learn the Maltese cross almost any time in your life. Um, and we can teach you that. So there's many beautiful aspects of this and you just have to change your mindset. What happens is there's a lot of baggage and a lot of blockages mentally and also physically. And so if you change your mindset and you say, you know, I'm a skating artist and I'm gonna attack this as an art form. And then I'm gonna break this down with these patterns and always focusing on fine performing decorative recording that my toe point actually matters and my pure edge and sustained um, music, when the vocals hit, you wanna be moving sculpture on the ice. Like Shepard, Debbie, Mary Ann, these, um, you know, all of our world skating artists, they know how to hit that and, and make moving sculpture on the ice. So it's a change of mindset um, that also is the epitome of greatness. 
And that's what we're pushing in the element. So it simplifies it, but yet elevates it. Mm. And one of the things we've talked about on the show that we're missing uh, in this like glorious era of skating that I was uh, privy to like uh, late eighties, early nineties, all this sort of stuff was everyone was making such beautiful pictures in their programs. There were such great shots of all the skaters in these beautiful poses that no one has time to make. Like well, we, that's we will watch a program in the first 10 seconds, they've, they've done like 38 different poses. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And so this, especially in the Shepherd and Debbie programs I watched, there was such beautiful long moments. I was like, oh, we could take a hundred gorgeous photos with less clutter and just more emotion and expression, which is, I think, if we're all being honest, is why the bulk of us are drawn to skating to begin with. Yeah, it's really, really nice, yeah. Yes, that's the epitome of fancy skating. Mm. Do each of you have a favorite program that you would consider fancy? Debbie, obviously you mentioned Dorothy's PAA suit before. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, you know, um, you know, that that's the world professional legacy being brought into and and demonstrating what um fancy skating can be and you know i mean i if if we're going to celebrate the world's greatest skating artists we have to be um open to all different types of art um like beth, beth warnoff did a contemporary program and um you know and so i i think that there is a lot where we will see this this championship continue to evolve, and um, you know, and having done it now, I mean, it. You know, you ask about um, how can how can someone who's just starting out, and um, and Karen has been so fantastic in including you know, everybody from, from all walks of life in world figure sport. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, having done this and, and coming from a figure background, um, you know, I think there are things that, that I can offer to, to come up with ways to make this, um, more, uh, more user-friendly for, for people who are new to this. Um, it, 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 it's challenging and a little bit intimidating to compete in a senior championship um, doing these figures that an, an Olympian is saying, I can't do this. <laughs> um, it, it, it can be, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I speak with the other skaters and, um, and I think that there's a way that we can work with Karen and structure this so that all levels can compete um, we could kind of normalize the judging and and make it so that um, you know it's not necessarily age or whatever that that determines you know where you're going to compete. So we have some ideas about that, and we're going to work with Karen um, and discuss you know things that we can do so that this can be a user friendly experience. I, and I I think you know we have we have fundamental figures that can help people learn the basics before they move on to, to more complicated things. And so maybe having a blend of those um, uh, fundamental figures with the creative figures um, might be something that, that can be useful and helpful. Yeah, so just to add for what Debbie's saying, because actually most people who've done the championship actually had no figure history. But the way that they were brought in mentally is by starting with the pivoting heart figure, where it's a three turn or a bracket. So, you know, um, Debbie's entire background in her life, you know, was more from, um, you know, more stress in, in the, um, you know, we never use the word school or compulsory because that's just doesn't just doesn't isn't helpful. It doesn't work at all. So they're fundamental figures, the circles. But most people who have competed in the last nine years, actually, and, and an amazing story of this is like Ann Bennett. OK, she actually persevered, medaled in 2020, has been skating the championship for multiple years. And what hooked her in was actually learning the Maltese cross, not even a fundamental figure because she didn't have a figure background at all. So it's a very interesting psychological dynamic that is in play 
when someone is like open to the art. So I actually find, um, and Nancy Blackwell Greeter will even tell you this, that she and Shepard and many people skated their whole life. And then she had a very young student who was only skating a year and two months. And she decided she was gonna try to teach him the Maltese cross. And she said that Andrew Becky, who was a world junior champion in figure and fancy skating, could skate the Maltese cross better than she could, which is not saying that's wrong or anything, meaning she was a great skater and she had a beautiful Maltese cross. She's saying he had less mental trauma, actually believing that he couldn't learn it because no one told him he couldn't learn it. Mm. So it's really actually a psychological, very interesting dynamic. And a lot of our Hall of Fame members like Nancy Blackwell Greeter have brought people into the championship who didn't have any figure background. And she noticed that basically sometimes we were more blocked, okay, than those coming into it with no blockage. Mm. And then you can actually like mold them. So a perfect example is a lot of the young skaters coming up um, also in world juniors actually skated this year and previous years, the Maltese cross and other difficult patterns um, and fell in love with doing the art of skating and the figures that way. So, you know, we play with all the dynamics and we help everyone, you know, world, world-class skating artists like Debbie who came in and was amazing, but you know, she's a perfectionist at the level of, you know, phenom. So, and everybody's different, but we all have to learn how to just, um, how to say evolve and let ourselves evolve as an artist. And also we've learned not to tell someone what they can't do. Cause sometimes it's so surprising what someone can do if the teacher isn't blocked and the student isn't blocked on what they can actually learn. It's been well, an interesting I, dynamic. And I'm curious because I would imagine something that precise could be nerve wracking, but I would think also to do it at a competitive level where they're watching you and they're breathing down your neck. I, that would like- yeah, but Nobody's crazy. breathing down your neck here. I know, I think that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, the, the blind judging in general always yes. seems so fairer, doesn't it? Ask Linda Frediani about Dagmar Lertz's uh, <laughs> figures in Lake Placid. Um, but I would also think that it's, that they're not right there. I would yeah, no, the sequestered judging much. works so well. I mean, it's, and, and then everyone on the ice, like they're a team. You have no idea how honored everyone was, um, you know, to be with Marianne Tisch, um, Shepard Clark, Debbie Thomas, Beth Warnoff. And what was also very interesting in the fancy skating was there's many different body types in world figure and fancy skating. And what you need to do is to do your style that works for your body type. And the top three women all had very different body types and very different styles, which was also very interesting because you didn't ever see the same general thing in the program. Like it really worked for them and their choreography and their body type, which was intellectually and artistically very fascinating. And my layman admission is I didn't realize it was exclusively judged on the pattern and not also how it looked while you were doing it. I didn't know if that was part of their criteria, <laughs> but they're really just watching the pattern, right? Even in the competitive thing, they're just looking at the pattern. Yeah. So why the hell do you need to be out there watching I, and make it? Yeah, I, you know, interestingly, the, the way you skate the, the figure is kind of important. Um, I don't know if the, we have a way of where we can have a partially sequestered um, judging system, but actually the the positions and the flow and all of those things are actually, you know, part of part of what makes mastering a figure difficult. And one of the things that I kind of wanted to emphasize and make figures interesting and cool is explaining to people just actually how difficult they are. I mean, after coming back and doing this, I'm like, we should have gotten a medal for every figure. <laughs> this is really, this is really difficult. Yeah. And, um, and what, you know, one of the main reasons that I came back is that I don't want to see that mastery go away. I mean, being able to you know, Shepard is probably one of the few people left that can really trace a figure one line um, and and have these, you know, perfectly shaped loops and things like that. Um, it It's really difficult to be able to do that. And it's, but it's wonderful to be able to watch somebody on a black ice, you know, just tracing perfectly. Um, mm -hmm. And so I kind of want to make sure that 
we we don't lose that you know like we don't want it to be so difficult that it's that it's hard to master them and make them you know no yeah for sure i mean we're we're very aware of like the balance and you know this year we had the four fundamental loops but in the loop de loop pattern which really highlighted debbie and shepherd's you know basic loops and even basic fundamental loops are very challenging but they're they are attainable so even though they're very difficult they are attainable so there's a difference because someone can really like cite themselves out saying how difficult this is and then they can never make an effort to try it, but it really is attainable. And there's nothing as pleasurable as actually when you actually make your first teardrop loop, it's a very exciting moment. Or when you make your first cross cut or you make your first really good three turn without a scratch in it. I mean, this is taking your blade and making yourself an artist. And this elevates and also is the, the roots. It's the anatomy of all of skating. And you're looking here at Shepard Clark, and you know who's just won seven World Figure and Fancy Skating Championships. He's medaled in nine championships. Um, you know, you're looking at Shepard, who you know has skated more of these types of figures than anyone in the whole world in the history of skating, and and yet he is just so calm and also so helpful for everyone, and inspires everyone to go out and and try it with him, no matter if they have any experience or not. And also how he inspired Debbie. I think is an epic story. I mean, this is, you know, a friendship and an epic story on, on a very special plane that shows you the great sportsmanship and the great artists that these two are. So who of your colleagues do you wanna, do you wanna pull in to this world? You working on it? Oh, I've already <laughs> challenged Boitano. <laughs> Yeah, we've talked. We've reached out to we, so many people. We've I lost track. Ilya Malinin to do a well, pair. Alyssa and Kurt are very interested. <laughs> Alyssa and yes, Kurt. Alert. Elvis, I think, has an interest. Uh, I think Priscilla yeah, Hill. Lot. Yeah, Priscilla. Uh, variety. I've, I've reached out. Well, we've reached out to. I mean, I've lost track. Just everyone we can think of. Okay. Amazing. I'm Karen Kadavi a message, but I she, she hasn't answered yet. She you might you know, see. I have something I'd like to add, Jonathan. I'm so glad that you are with us today because I've always considered opera to be really the zenith of the arts. You know, vocalizing, singing, Please. it truly is. I think it's the greatest gift, and I think that your perspective on what we're doing is is vital. I'm very excited about the prospect of helping David to maximize his potential and to embark on what I like to call the jeweled journey, uh, spinning treasure tales on the crystal carpet. I think we can have a great, great year in the 10th anniversary of world figure sport and the 100th anniversary of the Winter Olympics. Figures were the first Winter Olympic sport and um, this is a, a skill that's hundreds of years old, and it's a great joy to be able to work with you and with David and to maximize our potential. Yeah. So, why are the figures key for me maximizing my potential? Can you explain where that is? Yeah. I enjoy watching your videos. I enjoyed watching you work with Paul. You are a very good skater. I see you improve very quickly. You're intelligent. You adapt quickly. You know what uh, a shape and a line and positions are. What you're embarking upon is not easy because you have started later. But what I would like to prove working with you and for all of us to be working with you is to show how someone who started later, who's a, a highly inspired individual, who's doing something benevolent, important, and relevant in our sport and art form, to be able to participate in it actively and become not just a skating artist, a great skating artist. I believe that you can, and I believe that the figures are a way of incorporating absolute control, coordination, having balance like a cat, and for you to be able to bring dance and a story and emotion so that when people see you skate, they want to feel what you're feeling. Well, Karen, you're working with me off the ice and we've started a lot of foot and ankle strengthening. So can you explain how that will affect the figures and then my overall posture and skating? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna build, um, we're gonna build you into greatness from your foot all the way through the top of your head. 
So if anyone has any ankle weakness or a foot weakness, as Dr. Debbie Thomas would know, um, you know, we're starting with your kinetic chain in your foot. And because you started in the generation with stiffer boots, and you also weren't placed perfectly onto your basic four figure eights, your forward outside, your forward inside, your back outside, back inside, you know, you have some uh, weaknesses in your kinetic chain through your skating. And this um, building this into all of your entire body and your structure is how John Curry was built. And we're going to build you just like John Curry was built. So we're going to give you that fundamental foundation. We're going to give you that fundamental foundation that you were not, um, unfortunately, you were not given, but World Fear Sport is going to give that to you. I mean, and so you'll be able to have be like moving sculpture on the ice and be able to hit these sustained lines and edges. As long as I can tell the sob story from when I was a kid, because when I was a year old, I had a bar on my feet because they were born turned in. So I had the bar, which likely has to do with some of my ankle and foot issues. So, yes. We're going to help yeah. you with all everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for coming on. This is so exciting. And I think that, you know, there's a big movement that we can really do a lot with. So I think it's very exciting. Thank, Thank you. So you. grateful. Thank you so much. And we can't wait to see Jonathan with us. Yes. Singing. 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 Yes, singing. <laughs> well, Jonathan, we met some characters. All right. I thought, you know. And you know, we have had several, you have blessed me with several moments on this show. The first big one for me was meeting Sandra Bessick, like back in 2017 or whenever I got to be a part of it. And I was like, I could barely speak. And Debbie Thomas is another one. I, I and again, you, you want you always want to like meet him as an equal. I have found in like the opera world, it was always better to just meet someone as a person. But I really wanted to just fangirl out the entire time. Well, yeah. we didn't get into it, but she told me how she improvised her exhibition at the '88 Olympics to George Michael, and I thought, Debbie, you're kidding. And she's like, No, I'm serious. <laughs> and George Michael probably improvised a lot as well. <laughs> just do the short program again. That was my favorite. <laughs> But I did have quite the experience because I went from Lake Placid to the Dick Button Festival. So I had stayed there to work with Paul and Karen. And Karen's an amazing On videos. And it, you know, what I really liked is she was um, showing you the flying three turns and really how the axle was born. Oh, and yes. compare that to, do you remember when the ISU had Megan Duhamel like walking around with the mic asking people if they knew who invented the axle? And they were all like, mm. <laughs> I think the fun thing is that so many former skaters are getting into it because mm. Cheryl Franks came up and, uh, you know, like Mark Militano and his wife, Jana, like a lot of people are watching Debbie and watching the figures and having opinions. And I think that that's really exciting to re-engage people who often feel alienated by the current state of the sport. And it's interesting how they appreciate figures as they get older. So I think that that's really interesting, even for like, mental health, physical health, whatnot. I think there are a lot of people that would do a figure session, right? But maybe- well, and it's nice because they were showing both worlds. Karen's telling you, never never done them before, no problem. There's a way for you to enjoy this. And yet with like a Debbie and a Shepherd, they're doing a lot to legitimize it in a totally different community as well. So yeah. it's kind of this perfect union, I think. I think it's interesting how the young kids that do it and like how it's improving their skating. So I'm excited to see how it impacts my skating, you know, because it is such a core workout, like, like nothing else. So well, and I remember to the public, again, as, as an outsider, they sort of were selling to the public, don't worry about the, the figures being gone, we'll give them fields in the, or moves in the field. How did that work? We've established is definitely not the same. Yeah. 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 And so I think it's exciting. I mean, you know, at the, I do think, I hope at the Dick Button Festival, like I think it was missing Debra, Debbie and Shepard performing there. But obviously when they planned this, they didn't know that that was going to be such a moment the week before. But I do think with all of these festivals, like getting engaged with social media is so uh, important because I think a lot of people didn't know what the Dick Button Festival was. And I don't think that Scob really explained or promoted it as much as they could have to get the crowd really that they could have. Um, because there was so much fantastic skating. And also a lot of times like camps and clinics are really expensive and it was like 50 bucks to go to take class from Doug Webster, Nathan Birch. And like, you're in the class with Alyssa Sisney, which was funny because there were like a few of us adults, right? 
but you're taking it, we were taking it like in the class with Paul Wiley and Alyssa Sisney, who, and Liz Schmidt, as Nathan Birch is talking that your leg has to hit six positions on a cross roll, which is a lot to think about, right? He is describing this and they're like, Hmm. Hmm. Like really getting into it. It was kind of hysterical, but okay. yeah, so the, the quality of the instruction. And then they had Stephanie Grosscup who worked with Nathan as a kid. She okay. did a class with all the top skaters where they were like witches on the ice. Yes. And she okay, that was that. Okay. Yeah. Which was again, fascinating to watch. Was glad I wasn't on the ice for that, but I did do <laughs> this really great improv 360 spine movement class with Kate McSwain and Garrett Kling. Garrett actually did my first program. Uh, when I first started skating, he was in the Young Artist Showcase. Um, and, you know, they did a whole thing like with improv movements and then they would play music and say a word and you had to like move a certain way and then write down like what that movement like meant or how, what you thought of. And then we all like, discussed it. It was super interesting like afterwards. So yeah, we got in deep, okay. Yes. okay. Yeah. And again, I it was just, it's so helpful to hear that this is happening and to hear about um, the Dick Button, what do they call it, Academy? The Dick Button Artistic Festival. Festival, excuse me. Um, but because I feel like a broken record and just like a crotchety old man when I'm always like, yes, but what did the movement mean? And yes, why was, but why are you doing that movement? No, these why? are your people. We had Nathan Birch, Tim, <laughs> who made Dorothy's PAA Zoo, you right. know, and they did Afternoon of a Fawn with Ian Lorello uh, and Next Ice Age. And then uh, Ice Dance International was there. Liz Schmidt and Daniil did their Lorna oh, Brown so Timeless. I mean, yeah. it was, there was some really great skating, so. Um, it was a good, yeah, I think that it needs to, oh, Jeremy Abbott performed at the end. So yeah, there was a lot, a lot to see. I met Evie Scottfold's older sister, one of the Scottfold, Nancy was there. Uh, yeah, it was like really a, a bunch of like hidden gems in that, uh, I think Tenley was there the whole day supporting Elin. So Elin's another, yes, of course. So yeah. Elin's a lot of like when you take her class, it's like breathe in the energy. And then like you do the edge hail exercise. And like between each one, you're like breathing out that negativity. Yes. Okay. It's a thing. I used to be a skeptic of all that sort of stuff. We would do it in music all the time. And I'm like, oh, this is such hipster nonsense. Then sort of as you have life experiences, you have a different perspective, you come back older. And I was like, no, all of that was a hundred percent necessary. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I mean, the performances and I'll be posting more, you know, throughout the week because I have so much footage, but it was really, you know, there were some stellar, stellar moments. Alyssa Sisney doing experience was just incredible. Just but this is you just being is always lovely. Yeah. Always. Brooke was there. She did river dance. Yeah. She was getting artsy with Doug Webster's. Yes. Good. Well, what did you think of Shanghai this week? Because in, in the middle of this, Shanghai all last week, you mean Budapest? Budapest, sorry. Yes. I mean, yes, this, and this is a same big... competitors, different city, right? It's this is a hard left turn from everything we've been talking about. Sure has. So, mm -hmm. um, and I was understandably to your point, like it was a replication for many, many skaters to who just then popped over from Shanghai to Budapest. And I understand, and I wanted to ask you this, and I don't mean to bombard you, but I think you know all this. Um, I'm assuming like someone like Brady is just competing, 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 because she's trying to get the world ranking back up. Now, so are they basing that exclusively on placement or are they placing that on scores? Because for instance, Brady right. did win here. She did not necessarily skate very well, but she got she got a first place win. So does that boost her her world ranking? The first place absolutely boosts her within the points because you want to win. You have, if there are enough, at least five skaters, you can get ISU points for winning that senior B. So the okay. fact that she won does give her a, a certain number of points. Regardless of the score, okay. you want your season's best score to hit your ISU bio. This is really key, and it has to be at a official Senior B event, and, and a Challenger series has to, if it's a Challenger series, it can go on your bio. 
right? Yeah. So that score. So if there's a CS next to it, it'll be on your bio. This is why, you know, Atari made sure to go here. And it was, you know, there were, there were teams that they had, you know, maybe strategic alliances with. It, it all worked out great for Diana and Gleb. Um, but I, I don't know that I, I love that program. But, you know, the, it's really important because when judges are, they're, they're afraid to be wrong, right? The one thing, even in the USFS system for judges, they give you a percentage of how often you're within the group when you, it's in their system on the judges page in USFS, right? But what is that teaching you to do? And you could argue that it's teaching sure. you to be, yeah. it could be teach you to be a good judge, but it's also making you conform and submit to group think because otherwise you lose your position as a judge. If you fall below a certain percentage, you could have to retake judging school, do that again. So they are really focusing on this group think, yes, you can always defend your marks later, but you don't wanna be too out of that corridor. If you wanna make it as a judge, you have to learn to do that. And I think that that's actually dangerous. Then it's interesting you bring this up because then we can talk about American judge, Stephen, and the last name is HSU, two, I, two. okay, yeah. um, who was judging the free skate for the men's event. You're on skatingscores.com, our favorite yeah, website. I'm on skating yeah. through, going through like every panel. Now I really enjoyed Nikolai Memola. Okay, I found his short program in particular just so moving, and the commitment to to each move and how much where um, Shepard and Debbie were talking and Karen, they were saying, we want you to feel like you want to feel what they're feeling while they do it, which yeah. is something for singing. Also, when someone just hits this great note, I have often been like, man, I bet that feels good. The way that feels. And Nikolai just does a step sequence that makes me be like, I bet that feels awesome. And I'm just looking at skating scores. He had some technical errors. So in PCS, for the judges overall, he was third, he was second, he was second, he was third, he was second. USA had him 11th. USA was not buying it and not buying it by a lot. I was like, oh, it's been a while since we've seen such a great- 11th judge. is interesting. I wonder what that's about. Had yeah. him first technically and had him 11th in, in PCS. That to me is a moment where I would wonder why are you so out of out of the the pot? But maybe that's accurate, or maybe it's bad. You know, it depends yeah. when you go and what they were thinking of. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because yeah. we automatically go, oh, maybe it's wrong. But what if that person's actually correct, right? But I just happen to disagree with that person in this moment, so I think it's wrong. But yes, I have been in other places where you would say we have championed certain judges at events where we're like only so and so seemed to be watching the competition we were, and all of the other judges were watching a different one. Well, Vanessa Riley always stuck by uh, her convictions, <laughs> right? And she yeah. always convinced me. She always convinced me with her rationale. Yeah. Yeah. I so, thought of the women's event, I think Brady's obviously getting better. I think the dress is gorgeous for the free. Maybe the skirt could be altered a bit. Um, I don't think it matches the music at all. And I don't know that the music matches her personality, but it's... But did you... It's almost, okay. it's, like the music's not bad, right? Like it's a, it's a solid choice. Her dress is a solid choice, but it doesn't seem to work together, right? It doesn't, oh. the choreography, everything like that. Well, again, Turandot is a very heavy, dark, brutal, mm -hmm. brutal story. And uh, so this looked very elegant cocktail attire. It looked expensive. Mm -hmm. it, it was a, a classy choice, but I was not understanding it. And the minute she started, she was chasing the music. Mm -hmm. She she looked so physically exhausted, and I'm not saying it's not understandable. Having done the the travel and the jet lag and the time change to Shanghai, now to Budapest, like she just looked like she had nothing left in the tank. And and it's really when it started to unravel at the end. They try to splice in. First of all, I cannot stand. I'm assuming it's Sarah Brightman that version of Nessim Dorman. It does not climax where it's supposed to. It just can't because it's the wrong voice type and for many reasons, but there's a reason it was written for a tenor. There's such gorgeous female music written in Turandot. The, the arias of Liu, mm -hmm. sensational and would be so stunning in, in a skating program and no one uses it. Some of the cuts are odd, but really what was so alarming here was that she looked so tired by the end of it. 
And I don't think that's because she's not in shape or something like that. Like, I think it was just a, a miscalculated move, although she won. So I yeah. guess she got what she needed to out of it. It was just a rough skate. What did you think about the short program dress? I don't know. I, I half yeah. liked it. I like. I liked it except for all of what probably cost a million dollars worth of jewels on the arms. I just find overall the short program more successful as a piece of course. Yeah, I think when I watch her, I still get like, I think she's got a tight lower back that hurts when she goes to rotate the jumps. The, some of her take off. Um, okay. Seemed... Cause I was gonna add- Again, cause... Tara was talking about, you know, remember she's had those foot and ankle problems and she's had the back and it's all connected, right? So. Okay. Okay. And because it's interesting also, we are always taught like, is it under rotated? Look for the snow, look for the snow. But Brady does that big giveaway because you see just this wide swinging leg every time. Yeah. Um, and it was pretty prominent here, but, but I was just like, is that just because you're really tired? But, uh, you know, I have to say Claire Seal was doing quite a bit of that also. Claire actually got too close to the boards and one of her jumping passes skated through it and threw it in later. Again, Claire to me is one of those skaters who almost does it. And she's she's been in this almost, they were like, the jumps are almost rotated. She almost nails it and you can see that she has this potential i don't think that the music or the choreography are as good as she would be capable if she had an outside voice i think that there's a lot of sameness going on in colorado they all have the same coaches they all tend to work with the same people they don't seem very inspired on the outside and i think that that's one area where if u.s figure skating wants to move forward and make the sport more it was a very formulaic just add water sort of flamenco yeah. spanish inspired for all the all the moves you expected all of that sort of stuff and she was doing them but like we were talking about with the fancy skating and stuff i don't know she believed in any of them no and it just it's worked before right it was safe but i think when you're safe you don't push through so i i didn't think it either program was really inspired, but I thought that Claire has some really good skating skills to build off of. But obviously the jump rotations have been a problem for a while. And I think that that's something that needs to really be looked at, you know, now um, so that she can be successful later. If it's, you know, it's so hard to change these patterns, you know, at, at that point. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, and in the men's event, just really quick, like we had a win uh, in the free skate from Lucas, um, from Switzerland. I don't I don't know that that Lion King program is it for me. Um, and Jamoki, sort of as you were talking about Claire, now Jamoki has at times broken through in a bigger way, obviously, but still just, a, just sort of a bit of confusion about what we're doing here. And I understand if some people really love it and just wanna keep doing it. I don't know that that's necessarily what I see in this instance, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, Tomoki has had so much talent for so long. I don't think that the programs have ever really 100% maximized him on the ice or the performing aspect. He's always had really solid technique. I think the inconsistency gets up and down and that the overall packaging can just, I think that they could put together a more produced package yeah. with his look and styling and makeup and every, you know, really, you know, take those things. I think sometimes the boys from Colorado looked kind of lackadaisical, you know, over time when they were all training together, even though they're all huge talents. So I think in men's skating, it's so interesting because there, it's because there aren't as many competitors as women. Oftentimes early in the season, some of these men don't get organized as quickly as others because they have more time. Although now with the quads, you know, with everyone, that's not always the case, but it's, you know, traditionally you go to a men's competition at the lower levels. Maybe there's eight people, maybe there's 40 in the women's event. Right. So I think that that's just like a really interesting, you know, factor in skating where the women have had to push, but you know, this weekend is skate America. Who are you, you know, excited to see? Obviously Ilya Molinen is competing. Um, and they're starting to bring up that he did the quad axle last year. Uh, what do you make of, you know, his uh, I'm, just, I'm pulling up the roster here. Are you looking on um, Wikipedia? Yeah. Uh, you know, Kevin Amos will be there. Nika Agadze, Shun Sato, uh, Dennis Vasiliev, uh, Ilya Malin and Maxim Naumov and Andrew Torgashev. I think for Naumov and Torgashev, I think, 
Uh, oh, and Stephen Gogolev as well. And I think he's in the same boat. Now, Umov, Togashev, and Gogolev, I think all really have a lot to prove uh, that oh, they- yeah. It was Torgashev that we watched at Lombardia. I believe in this material him, for him this year so much. I mean, I hope he can deliver it because again, that step sequence at Lombardia was just out of this world. It was so sensational um, because we know what Ilya is going to give. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I'm not sure what Andrew is capable of. And I really am hoping he pulls it out. I would have been interested. Ironically, I'll be very near there. I'm performing in Fort Worth with the Clyburn Fund. <laughs> And it's like right there. But then I was like, oh, do I extend the trip? And I have to be honest, I sadly looked at the roster and was like, nah, I don't know if it's worth it for me. But I would have loved to have seen Kevin and Torgashev in particular. Uh, I think in Kevin is always fascinating to watch. And I think it would be worth going to. Uh, mm -hmm. I think for you know the women, it's Amber Glenn, Isabel Levito, Claire Sio, who we just saw, um, Young Yu, uh, Sion Wee. Uh, Ekaterina Kurakova, Hana Yoshida, Monica Wabe, Mona Chiba, Nita Petrokina, and Nini from China. So, oh, and Luna Hendricks. So I'm interested to see that. Luna has had a little bit of a slower start to the season. And, you know, I don't think that her programs have really been shining yet. She looked kind of nervous at the Japan Open. So I'm hoping to see her up the performance because I think that that's... What I'm curious about also is have we had any updates because we we had heard that Amber Glenn was doing so well yeah. and that unfortunately got derailed. Um, have we heard I mean, I think, I think she said that things were going well in her call, uh, with, but, you know, skaters always say things are going well. I don't know. I think, I hope that she is. I hope that this didn't derail her, but she's listed to compete as of now. So... Um, I think what, what would they say at work? They would say more to come on that, right? I mean, okay. this is this would be a real moment for her to get a title or Isabeau to get a title. I think it would be really crucial or Luna, right? I think of those three, I think they all would benefit from having, you know, a gold medal at a Grand Prix yeah. that would help raise yeah. all of the stature. So uh, I think it's really critical. The pairs event, you know, there were... The Japanese had to withdraw. Um, Ruchi has a back injury. So obviously that's not great, but good that they're taking time now to rest. Um, and they were having a slower start. So maybe that's part of why. Uh, we will see Leah and Trent uh, from Canada. Anika Hawk and Robert Kunkel uh, are going to be uh, you know, from Germany. And then we have Chelsea Liu and Balaj Nagy. Isabel Martins and Ryan Bedard uh, are a new replacement. They uh, replaced Danny Newdecker. Um, and uh, Evelyn Grace Hans, and there's no like official reason listed uh, with their withdrawal, uh, and Valentina Plazas and Maximiliano Fernandez uh, for pairs. So not the strongest pair field. Some people were saying that um, it's a shame that, you know, Matteo Guarisi wasn't invited to at least make it more competitive. Uh, yeah. Replaced yeah. Uh, the Japanese team with a team from the UK who's just not, as strong right. so and i think this year you know italian pairs will be super strong and matteo may be on the short end of that as they build up their number of you know slots but yeah, we yeah. saw we saw this weekend also just as like a quick side note we saw sarah and and uh, God, I Sarah yes yeah. what did you i mean more of the same what they have is what seemingly no one else does which are such consistent easy side-by-side -side triples non-stop Pairs elements, choreographically, not really doing it for me. But it's so funny because we have so many other teams that have fantastic pairs elements and some interesting choreography. Cannot seem to land those side by sides. And then we have one with the jumps, but maybe not, not much else. I find that program very consistent, but consistently blah, right? Yeah. No, right. <laughs> I think the dance event will be really interesting. Holly Harris and Jason Chan. Uh, Marjorie Lejoie and Zach are like, huh? Both Czech dance teams. Both Czech team. sibling dance teams. <laughs> both outrageously powerful and wild, and I adore them both. Yes. Lopareva and Jeffrey Brassad, Hannah Lim and Yi Kwan, Olivia Smart and Tim Deek, the Browns, Chalk and Bates, and Green and Parsons. That is a stacked dance event. Yeah. So, And I, I think there's a lot on the line 
in my opinion, for Green and Parsons here. Yes. Uh, because I there are, with the Czech teams, with the Canadian team, like, I Even think... The Browns have been steadily improved by it. I think they've they've really got to pull out all the stops. This could because they had not a great debut. I think there were Lombardia also, um, but they they need to to sort of get back in that that upper echelon. I think in order to sort of stay in that upper group. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm excited for the dance event. I think it's going to be really exciting. We'll have to find out from Renee what she makes of everyone. <laughs> you know. <laughs> always the case and then i was also floored what was this event we saw jia shen at it was like a it was a korean only junior event yes because they're deciding who they're going to send to the junior olympics as though they didn't know that they were going to send jia i mean i think that that was clear and right there weren't a hundred competitions to have considered from already <laughs> yeah this is going to be the one that determines it jonathan this, this is the this is the one Yes. So what if she tanked and someone random did really well? Were you really going to send that person? I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So. But I'm excited to see Gia. I think more extension always, but she says such a nice quality on the ice that's developing and a lot of consistency that's developing, especially as Mao Shimada has been up and down. So I yeah. think that mini rivalry is really exciting. I think. I mean, I think. Personally, I think Mao Shimada is plenty safe, but it's it's good that there's oh. an interesting thing happening here. Yeah. Mao Shimada keeps going for the quad that doesn't really seem close this season. So yeah. I think strategically, um, I wonder, you know, and I wonder she's gotten taller and this is, you know, a school where what happened to Rika Kihira? She's not competing at all this year, right? Uh, Satoko, the most beautiful skater, she left Mia Hamada and didn't look back. Marin Honda, right? What has happened with all of these gorgeous skaters, but, you know, their careers haven't necessarily panned out. Obviously, there was the case against uh, Mia Hamada and, and the stories about that. So, you know, I think there's some concern about, you know, those coaching methods and yeah. whatnot. So, yeah, I'll be interested to see and hope for the best because i do think mao shimada is such oh, such a, a joy to watch yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah well what was your moment of the week i mean i did enjoy nikolai memela with the quad lots the short program was very powerful but i think i'm gonna go with meeting debbie thomas obviously <laughs> okay yes i mean <laughs> Oh, and I wanted to just send a, a quick thank you. Um, all of the TSL viewers were very sweet with their birthday messages last week. Yes, how did so, you celebrate? Oh, please, I taught all day. I mean, Yeah, but I, did you like go see a show? Did you? Oh, night? I have seen some dreadful shows on Broadway. Fortunately, uh, that was not a night I had to do it. But I got a new mohair sofa. That arrived. That oh, was yes, yes. Yeah, so. That was, it was delayed the one day we were going to do it and then it was coming later, so. It was, a nightmare. it was a nightmare because it didn't fit up the stairs. Yeah, so. Yeah. Boring story, sorry. What was your moment of the week, Dave? <laughs> oh, man. I think take, taking Nathan Birch's ed, Edge class was. Like, that was the highlight. Phenomenal. Um, seeing Liz Schmidt and Danielle Skate is always oh, incredible. Yeah. And Alyssa. Yeah. And then Afternoon of a Fawn from that. Those were, I think when you see really great skating like that, you're like, oh my goodness, we need to be doing more of this, right? Like, and figuring out how to organize it and package it for people so that they can appreciate it. Right. Because people do respond to it when it's posted. So That's there awesome. is an interest. Yeah, you know, on social media, and it's different, and it it captures that. So when you see this, you know, fancy skating, I mean, it does. I would them. have had no idea, as yeah. someone who is not on the super inside that way. The it was only because you were posting the things from the Dick Button Festival and and this, and to see it is to enjoy it. Well, you know, so I heard Karen talking about figures with people and she was talking about that two people in the ISU hated figures and really pushed for them to be eliminated. And she was like, and if they didn't like figures, maybe you should be doing something else. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, well, I don't really want to skate for points. Like I don't, one, I don't think that the rules are really, 
accurate in adult skating because they don't change the weights of like what it's like to work this or like even in spins like is a really well do i want to learn a really great sit spin with great technique or do i want to focus on contorting myself to hit levels personally i'd rather have the aesthetics and then do something like or or fast and with quality but you know and it's just like a disagreement that i have with those even even do you remember in um in schools like the teacher could be telling you i'm talking like high school and that sort of stuff teacher could be teaching you something so amazing and incredible and someone would be like is this on the test yes and if it's not on the test we're not interested in learning it and i what if this was just cool to hear about like i don't know like same idea like i i i'm interested in learning different you know spins and work on them but i don't want to do it just for points like I want it to look good right like I want something to look cohesive and And again talking about wanting to feel what something feels like you Mm. see those end of programs scratch spins that are blurred and amazing then they throw their arms up that looks like it feels amazing to do the the this that that and the crappy illusion like I was like this doesn't look interesting to do and it's not interesting to watch yeah I'm but, glad it's hard I'm glad I got a lot of points I but yeah not, yeah so. so I don't know that's kind of just I I kind of like the idea of taking a year to like learn figures and see what it could do to my overall skating and then how does that change how I think about things right yeah and the connection to Pilates and off ice stretching and strengthening and like putting all of those together. So yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking about because I don't, I don't really want to skate for points in that way. Like I don't like it. That is that really why you skate? Is that no. so you can go do a competition and get these points? No. And I don't like agree with it, <laughs> right? So I, I. Was like and maybe, maybe for some, as we've mentioned, maybe that is all they're into. Because I think for, I think the majority of people certainly I talk to are in it for the art and the, the pure expression and the incredible techniques and all this sort of stuff. I think some people are just about getting a title and cash in and points. Yeah, but, but it doesn't mean really, like, it's not, it's not actually, it's not like it's easier, right? Like it's harder to focus on all of the details and stuff like right. that. Right. Yeah, I don't know. It's just where I kind of want to put my focus. I've been thinking yeah. about what I wanted to do and yeah, that, so. Delightful. Yeah, we'll see how it goes, you know? <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> but yeah, this Skate America this weekend is going to be, I don't, I, I, it's going to be, I haven't seen a lot of promotion for it, so, All right? Nothing. Oh, even when you just said it, I was like, oh, right, that is this week. Yeah, like you get some U.S. figure skating emails, but where are the people on the Today Show and 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 this? and They did. I did see something in like just my phone's like news section about Debbie coming back. Yes. I have not seen anything about Skate America. Right, because Debbie is a personality. They haven't built these other skaters as personalities yet. And then do the rules allow that personality to come out on the ice? Right. And that individuality. And so, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Under that, folks. Under that. <laughs> Hold an edge to look sexy, everyone. Okay. <laughs>